Hello and welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. My name is Graham Arrowsmith. And my name's Kevin Appleby. So, Graham, today we've got a lady called Jane Shaw with us. We oh. do, and she's quite serious. Um, and this is her first uh, podcast. Actually, she runs a business uh, called Serious Development. So, Jane, welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. Thank you, guys. It's an honour to be here. It's my inaugural podcast recording. Oh, but it won't be your last, I can tell you that. Uh, you're, you're now famous uh, because you've been on the next 100 days. This long-running business podcast where we have one guest every week. Um, and uh, Or if, if we're unlucky, we have to talk to each other. So basically, um, today we, we're really looking forward to this because you, you're going to talk about all kinds of things. But you, one of the things that you kind of um, on top of um, is time management. I am, although uh, mostly because uh, I don't believe in it, which was the sort of starting point of this. So I am, I work as an associate uh, to a number of people, but one of the training companies called Nine Dots, right. and they approached me last year and said, we gather feedback from all the courses that we run and we ask people, you know, what's the course topic that you'd most like to do next? And they said, for some reason, over the last year, the one topic that keeps coming up is time management. Um, do you want to do something about that? And I went, well, no, because <laughs> uh, I don't believe in time management. Um, I genuinely think that time is a, is a construct that exists. Actually, what we need to do is learn how to manage ourselves. So they kind of got curious about this, especially because I would imagine like many training companies, they have lots of time management courses on their books. <laughs> so uh, we developed uh, an idea of saying, well, and in fact, they're trialing it for free for people uh, to say, well, maybe it isn't just about having a good to do list or being really focused or using all these productivity tools. Actually, in the last two years, a whole load of stuff has changed. And how are we paying attention to that? Are we looking after ourselves in all of this? And are there some other avenues that we might need to explore uh, around that subject that may not just be about managing time? I, I guess you're going to, I mean, because, I mean, Kevin's really bright, but, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a few chapters behind him on news on most things. But when it comes to this, I'm a bit unsure about what you're, what you're really saying. So can you dig into it a little bit more for yeah, us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think the thing is, we are, I think COVID and the pandemic has done an awful lot to push people into wanting to be seen as productive. You know, the pressure of suddenly my, the, you know, the, the uh, historical observable presenteeism has disappeared. And people have felt incredible pressures around working at home, the blurred lines, the loss of even that sort of um, a commuting buffer of the break of time in between work and home and all of yeah. those things. And I think that has shifted people's, and people are, there's something we call about um, fragile trust. So if I have no longer had face-to-face -face with people, uh, my manager, my colleagues, and it's been dependent on the connections we've made over an electronic format, um, I think people are questioning is what I'm doing good enough? Am I producing enough compared to others? I feel that there's a more isolated uh, perspective on comparison and value add and outputs. And so I think people are questioning, well, am I doing enough? Am I good enough? Am I showing that in some way? So I think the, that's what triggered my concern was, I'm not sure it's about productivity. I think it's about a more holistic and perhaps kinder self-reflection that says actually, how are you in all of this? You know, what's what's changed and how are you coping with that? So the, the idea for me is that there are other things, whether it be um, how we're deciding what our priorities are. You know, uh, we're very familiar, I'm sure, with the urgent versus important matrix. But actually, when was the last time we stopped and asked ourselves, what does urgent mean to us? What does important mean to us? And are we therefore distributing those the time across those things well? And that's just one of the subjects that we we suggest people look at. Does okay. that you've got work? you've got a series of tools then? Um, but one of the things I picked up on what you've just said is was this idea of um, kindness. This the, the idea that um, because people are living well for the moment until until people get back to work without masks and all the rest of that. Hopefully, anyway, um, then 
you know, people need that extra arm around their shoulders because people, they don't have the person to person contact, even though you might be doing it on like we're doing it now, recording over Zoom. You don't, it's not quite the same as, as being in the same room together, is it? No, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I think uh, I may have mentioned before, I'm uh, uh, currently doing my master's in business psychology at the University mm. of East London. And one mm. of my lecturers in our first term mentioned that 80% of the dissertations last year all mentioned COVID in the title. So in the occupational psychology field, of course, everybody is talking about the impact of work on, on individuals, the workplace productivity, et cetera. But the kindness piece for me is about saying, what standards am I holding myself to and, and are they okay? So it's, it's a little bit of self-care. So I also um, have a, a postgrad diploma in coaching psychology. So I have a coaching practice as well. Mm. And a lot of what I find is when you give people space and time to think and to reflect and to kind of connect with how they're winning, you know, what's really going on for them. And you, you might be familiar with the idea of somatic coaching, which is the whole body stuff. There's, you know, I genuinely, I sometimes, it's a bit of a throwaway line, but sincerely, I would say eight out of 10 of my coaches will cry. They get upset. They get emotional. And that, that feeling is so close to the surface of I'm just coping. I'm just getting by. So I think this added pressure of, be more productive, utilize tools, make sure you're available. You know, all of these things are, are, are removing the humanity, I think, of, of the working on. Um, I getting... think I really agree with you there, Jane. And yeah. I think from a personal point of view, I'm feeling pretty much screened out. You know? Working, for, okay, I've worked pretty much from home for a long time. But it's always been interspaced with going to see clients and quite regularly spending time on client side. Mm. That over the last two years has changed. I think I've been on client side with an actual client once in the last two years. Um, so there's something about, you know, you walk into the office in the morning, which is effectively you just come downstairs. You switch on the screen. And there's something in the psychology that says unless you're doing something at that screen, then you're not working. But yesterday, I had to take a dog to the vet first thing in the morning. Then I had to go and visit a solicitor with, with mum to organise some paperwork and so on. And I spent actually a lot of time away from the desk yesterday. And actually, it was just so nice to have some thinking time. And actually, some time, I used to listen to a lot of podcasts. And that seems to have gone out the window a little bit because I'm never traveling, which was the, the point that I always used to listen to them. But I really do think there's something about, you know, you're not working unless you're sitting in front of a computer, you're typing away, and you're doing something and being productive. Well, actually, you think back to your time in the office, that was probably only about 50% of it. There's so much time talking to people, traveling between locations, having meetings that were somewhat different to the meetings we have over Zoom. That's, that's the change for me, thinking space. What do you think to that then? Is, it, is, it, um, is Kevin hitting the nail uh, on this one? Is it, is it about the fact that we're not connecting to people and therefore we don't? Are you saying that we're not as productive? I, I think we believe we are, I think we're using a lens of what productivity looks like right. that potentially is distorted. So I think to Kevin's point, really interestingly of saying, well, actually maybe 50% of my productive time historically was, and I often tell, because I, you know, I, I run leadership training programs, and I have to say to people, conversation is work. You know, conversation is work. It's where, you know, one of my clients is in the rail industry and they were talking about one of the hardest things for them, the very specific niche engineering design and they were saying one of the hardest things is they've got a whole load of you know 50 plus incredibly experienced knowledgeable engineers who wander past the desk of an inexperienced engineer and go what are you doing well that looks interesting and that kind of informal knowledge share and evolution is is very difficult to recreate in this format so I think what I'm saying is is I don't believe that people are less productive in fact I think there is little evidence to suggest there is a drop in productivity. Mm. I mean, there are some lovely outlier stories of people who have gone 
my boss doesn't know what I do to the point where I've actually got a second full-time job and both of them think I'm working from home and I'm pretty much playing computer games and sending in the odd report. So there are stories of people going, I'm holding down two jobs and they think I'm being productive and paying me for full-time jobs. Now, I would suggest there aren't many of those, but I think the product, that for me, it's about saying, when was the last time you just checked that the balance that you have, and I don't use work-life balance, but just the balance of where and how you expend your energy is right for you now. And one of the things that, uh, you know, I think what the nine dots stuff that we, we, we've curated, and I use the word curated because, you know, it's not original research, it's just cherry picking some of the relevance. One of the big topics for me is resilience versus endurance. And that's the key, you know, to Kevin's point of saying, having a break, going away, changing gear, doing something in a different environment with different people. Yeah. The change is good as a rest is a, is a, is a phrase for a reason. And I think that's no, I, it. I agree. I mean, back in the day when I had uh, large teams and so forth, if, if you wanted to try and de um, escalate a, a problem, then you would change the environment that you were in. You, you know, go for a walk. You you go into a different room. You do you you diff, you you would take them out of the situation, and and all of a sudden you could commute. You can, you know, converse with each other. Um, but I, I I have this. If I follow you right, and and it's 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 catching it's catching you up a little bit here. You've got um, a program which will help somebody who feels, shall we say, detached from. I guess the the mores, if you like, of of work. So, in other words, I kind of know that I'm being productive because I can in, in an office. I can look over there, and there's Sally and John and and Trevor, and they're right lazy so and sos. I can I know that because I'm working with them every day. But and I'm always getting my reports out because I can see it. But if they're all at home, you haven't got a Scooby Doo, have you? I think it's an interesting point, isn't it, about whether or not we do compare ourselves to others. And with this level of isolation and this fragility of trust, I think there's an element of how do I show that I'm being productive or my output is, is equivalent or better than others? And some people will be worrying about that. They're what yeah. my old marketing professor used to call paranoid overachievers. They're the, you know, the guys who, you know, everything's got to be perfect and it's got to be done. But actually, that's not, it's not reasonable to ask that of human beings, I don't think. I like that phrase. I mean, Kevin, I'm sure you'll use that phrase in a blog post soon to be um, to, to be published. What was that again? Paranoid I think, I think overachievers. I think the word already, Graham. So there's very little chance of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I like. Well, I kind of understand that because I think sometimes if you've got it in you and you really want to do well in a the business, then you do work yourself. Um, I, I like Kevin. I've worked at home for a long time, and. Um, but I, I, you know, we're in a very privileged position that we, you know, we run our own businesses. And so therefore we can do what we want, but there's still clients to look after and there's still work to get done. But like Kevin, I don't have a dog, but I do have a, a, t um, a target this year, which is to walk a thousand miles. And, and that basically is because um, if you do 10,000 steps, then that's about five and a bit miles. And it takes us out, you know, into the country through a smelly farm along the canal you know, uh, or canal bank. I don't walk and walk water, but um, um, although some people might think that I do, and <laughs> I understand that, I don't want to dissuade them of that. But the point is, and and, by, and that, that gets about ten thousand steps. So basically, by doing that on a regular basis, say twenty five miles a week or a bit more, I'll get to my thousand miles in you know in relatively good order, maybe by October. So that's the plan. That's my sort of physical objective for this this year. Um, but during that time, to Kevin's point about podcasts, I will listen to various podcasts on the way around. But today, weirdly, I forgot my head, my, my earphones. So I had to do some thinking. And oddly enough, stuff, no, 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 I, no, I realized it. It, it was just like teeing it up for you there, wasn't it? I, I was. <laughs> But the idea of the, the, the thinking, I was, I had a client meeting before I went. And so basically I was thinking about how I might best help them. And it was quite a tricky one. And, but I, I got onto other things as well about various other, other business issues I've got. But actually it's, it, it's almost got me to the position that says, forget the ear, earphones more often. Yeah. And I think that's it. I think we are, 
about, you know, there's there's a whole load of links to being bored and creativity. There's a whole load of that, you know, quietening everything else down to allow the good stuff to happen. I mean, Stephen Covey, you know, we can look at the seven habits of the sharpening your axe thing. It's yeah. basically the same principle, isn't it? It's saying, am I giving myself um, enough? There's a lovely thing I read the other day about short rituals of recovery. And it was this idea that we should, you know, every 90 minutes, especially in this kind of environment, we should be saying we should have a short ritual of recovery. This is part of our resilience rather than saying, I've worked six hours straight without a break. I am invincible. Uh, and yet what then happens is you become less productive and, you know, neuroscience will go down the route of our neocortex battery draining stuff of, of, of the effort that it takes. So that I think there is something that says, is it a lost art? That's a really interesting thought, isn't it? I feel like that's something else to explore. Is it a lost art of this, this quiet thinking time? Um, but to me, one of the things that, you know, I've curated to, to share with people is not a all of these things will feel relevant, but some of them might help you just yeah. find a way of saying, is this is this something I'm not very good at or I'm not doing as well as I could do? So am I able to say no? Something yeah. I hear a lot, you know, uh, in, in certainly in facilitation over the years is people being able to assert and push back and be really clear about where their boundaries are. I mean, you mentioned um, this free resource at uh, Nine Dots, and actually yeah. Nine Dots is where we first got to know about you because uh, Adila uh, Jassat, she basically got in touch and she she said that you were brilliant. Now, we know different now, of course, but... Um, Obviously, I've been um, found but, out. It had to happen. Yeah, 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 you found out, absolutely. We, 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 we are super brilliant now, but of course. But the, <laughs> but the nice thing is, is, is that if they're offering some free resource, that effectively... You know, helps them build relationships with people. But what what's in this free resource? What 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 can people expect? So the idea is that we've uh, I have curated for nine dots um, seven one day messages that you will receive, and it's an invitation to take part in an activity uh, that will take fifteen minutes of your precious time. Mm. And as I said, the idea is that some or all of these will feel more or less relevant. But if you're the kind of person that has been on time management courses and knows all about the productivity tools, but still can't work out why you're not using them or why that you started with the best of intentions and then it all fell away, then this might offer, um, I would think of it more as, as like little avenues to explore. So it might be it is the urgent and important matrix. It might be it's about being able to say no. It might be even um, looking at your procrastination. Uh, oh. And I've, uh, I've found a wonderful resource to, to help people with that uh, and just to access that and make sense of what it is and what's going on for them. But it's about taking back control, I think, a lot of yeah. it. Um, and and a lot, also I've put in there uh, the Wheel of Life, which you might be familiar with as well, this idea of just saying what aspects, when you look at all of the aspects of your life, whether it be family, relationships, work, health, exercise, whatever your headings are, yeah. How are you doing on a score of one to 10 base? It's very subjective, but then you kind of map it out and go, oh, yeah, you know, maybe there's some things that need more attention. So where do I get the energy from to put into that the stuff that's really important to me? Right. I mean, that's going to that is going to help people, isn't it? I mean, imagine a lot of people listening to this might be interested in in getting that. So we will put a link to um, to the place that they can get that uh, resource from. And hopefully that will develop relationships with nine dots as well as you so from that point of view that's 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 very useful all i would say is is that procrastination can lead to such a waste of time can't it because you're not really making a firm decision are you yeah and i think there are there's a difference between recognizing when a decision needs space and time so you know uh if you look at all the decision making stuff around complex decisions it suggests some need more time than others. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm reminded of Marvin Weisbord's future search stuff uh, when he talks about, you know, have, sleep on it. You know, there's right. always go away and sleep on it. There's stuff like that. But I think procrastination is when you realise that you are potentially, well, I think, no, let me not this. There are so many reasons. And one of the, one of the things to do is to identify what yours is. 
And often if we go down, uh, you know, we could link it to gestalt uh, psychotherapy and talk about the, what we pay attention to. What else is really going on that's stopping us? What are we avoiding and why? And I think sometimes we lack, interestingly to, to our point we've already made, making time to really notice what that is. So what am I putting off and why? Is it for the right reasons? Because, you know, if I sleep on this, something else may emerge. You know, pause to go faster is a thing, yes. But actually, is it a hindrance? Am I then being seen as indecisive? And is that true of me? Or is there something else going on? So again, it's self-awareness. It's emotional intelligence, one of my other favourite subjects in uh, so this, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, you, what your interventions are, you start by saying, I don't want to be, I don't want to do the regular time management thing. And um, back in the um, 1980s, we had something called Time Manager when I was working for Lego, the toy company. Oh, I remember that. That was back in ICI. They loved Time Manager, been on all the courses, had all the file faxes and all the paper sheets. And Yeah. And I've, I've probably still got the book of it somewhere, but basically what to do. But um but the, um, I think it's actually a Danish company, or it was a Danish company. I think that's the, that was the link. And um, uh, anyway, we had these really lovely um, leather-bound time management sheets. And, and oh, it was never a big enough grade in ICI to get the leather version, Graham. Oh, well, you are, you know, it is. Um, but um, but and, and, and effectively, that, that basically, you ran your life with these things, so if you ever lost it. Um, but the, 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 the thing about that was it, it was a system to – try and leverage the best out of you um, and the time that you have during, well, mainly during the working hours. Um, so um, is, you're not really going down that route. Right? You're, not, you're not being prescriptive about, you know, filling this, use this app, fill in this. For, what, you're getting into the real sinews, if you like, you're into the real worries that people have that leads to this wrong behavior when it comes to time. <laughs> Absolutely. Although the the wrong behaviour, I feel, might be a little judgmental. Graham, well, we could be kinder than that. <laughs> oh, I, I, I never, you know, never knowingly not judgmental. Um, that that that's my um, John Lewis phrase there. Um, but um, but no, no, I I I like to be judgmental because it, it, at least it set, separates me from the vast majority of um, of people. But anyway, by and by. Um, that's why so, he's actually called Graham No Mate. No. <laughs> <laughs> but no, oh, well. Graham, time manager. I think and I, I still use all of the principles that were laid down in Time Manager. And in fact, that's the way I use Trello for task management. Okay. And I think that's the issue here, that that system was called Time Manager International. It's it actually was, yeah. should have been called Task Manager International. Now, it's managing your to-do lists effectively and it's project planning. Yeah, that's that's an operational guy telling a marketer yeah. what you should what you should call the product. But um, I, I, yeah. I'll I'll take yeah. your ideas. But I, I think there are deeper them. things here, and there's questions that that the things that I've been asking myself over the last year are well, actually, how long is a working day? Now, back in the old way of doing things, you commuted into the office for sometime around nine o'clock. You commuted yeah. home sometime between five and six, and you did stuff in between the two. And then as a consultant, we had a billing system and said, well, if you commuted into the client site, spent some time there, done some stuff, you commute home, but you bill, you bill an eight-hour day. So you bring this into the new way of doing things. You amble up into your own office. You do some stuff. You're probably, for a period of time, a hell of a lot more productive than you were actually in the office. And then you get bored a bit. You go do some other stuff. Um, and you get to the end of the day. You know, oh, I've probably spent five hours doing some work. Oh, hang on, I better do another three this evening to make the eight up. Yeah. But you know, then you think, hang on a minute, though. In those five hours that I was actually working, I've probably done just as much work as I would have normally done on during eight days, eight hours when I was actually on the client site. Um, so, you know, what is a working day is a good question one to, to address with time management. Well, you've got an expert here. So what is a working day, Jane? <laughs> oh, I feel the spotlight suddenly on me there. Um, yeah, I, Kevin, thank you for that, because I think it's really, really insightful. Interesting, earlier today I attended, uh, I did my 
MBA years ago at Henley, and they've now got a centre of leadership. And I attended one of their um, uh, lunchtime seminar things. It was really interesting. And they were talking about uh, leadership in, in the new sort of normal. And we're also identifying that basically there isn't a new normal. And actually what, what they want, lead, what leaders should be doing now is constantly adjusting to the fact that we're constantly adjusting, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, and what one of the things, and this is, uh, bear with me, Kevin, I'll get there, because I think that the answer I'm trying to come up with is, um, who's to say? Uh, and this, to me, comes back to the point about productivity. Well, isn't, it, isn't think, it, Jane, isn't it the person who's paying you? Well, this is this is the interesting tension between, and, and it was quite in, in this seminar that I attended, they were talking a lot about how uh, organisations and leaders need to be inclusive and respecting the individual. And one of the things I wanted, I was kind of going, but what about the, ten- they're still being paid to do a job. There's still an expectation of some output to a standard yeah. to fulfil the requirements of a role. Yeah. Um, but does that mean they have to meet what we previously saw as the outputs of that role? So in that, in terms of, of Kevin's point, is an eight hour day what's required to do that role or is it? five hours uh, who knows and I think it's I think um uh, Bernd Vogel who's the professor at Henley was talking about exploration phases and evolution and I think when you ask those questions about what's a working day I don't think there's one fixed answer anymore and I don't know if there ever will be uh, and, and I think the danger has been that organizations have been moving to almost automation of humans And Amazon, you know, famously is being accused of this. Mm. Uh, And I think that the you're then seeing a a kind of bit of a backlash. So you've got Gary Hamill writing books called Humanocracy, trying to say that the bureaucracy itself isn't acceptable. We need to be more human. And that has a responsiveness, I think. And to your point, Kevin, maybe it is saying, well, what 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 gets the best out of people that meets the needs of the organisation? So in a very long winded way, did I answer that question? I'm not sure. It did. Think, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 um, I would still circle it back to the probably to who pays, but I would say that there are two, well, probably more than two, but, but, but there are two obvious um, d- uh, dimensions to this. One, which is large companies, big organizations. And the other one are small companies. And I, I, I think it's a, it'll be a lot harder for those large organizations who are inclined to be like Amazon, um, you know, get, get, and, and actually they'll probably be the ones who will lead AI into organizational life. And the, and the, the, the rump of humans working around AI um, will be AI like, or almost AI light, you know, but I think when it comes to small businesses maybe and maybe medium-sized businesses, I think what's going to happen with them is that maybe they'll, they'll become more human. I cannot imagine that they will um, follow those big, dumb companies because, frankly, they haven't got the money to do that. So that I think what they'll become better at and they might have to become better at is the way in which they use their human resources in a way that actually outguns those people with lots of robots mm. well I, I don't because I, I kind of I want to challenge that a little bit because um I was listening to uh Paul Polman is it the ex-CEO of Unilever right and he's another one who's produced a book and of course he's talking about it but he was also talking about his 10-year tenure at Unilever yeah. was about um, I, I mean, he didn't quite use these words, but in essence, it was about the humanization of the organization and saying that you've got to, whilst it's a vehicle uh, for productivity, for profit, it shouldn't be profit at any cost. And interestingly, you know, when you look at an organization the size of Unilever, I, th- uh, Unilever, I think the inference was it isn't about, you know, uh, automating everything, including the people. There's got to be a recognition of the richness of what humans bring, and that means it's got to be the kind of workplace or environment or organisational culture mm-hmm. that people want to work in. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, look, I, I think there's enough room um, that we'll we'll find out uh, within you know if we, we this podcast fortunately will be preserved because it's such an important 
contribution to 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 British business life. And so in 20 or 30 years, when this is all happening, they'll look back and they'll think, do you know what? You were right. Or more or less right. Who knows? But, Who knows? But they'll be referring to Kevin rather than me. <laughs> And 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 Jane Jane will come out as the as the star because you'll have you'll have nailed it. But I, I genuinely, it's not just about the way in which people use time because you you've got other strings to your bow as well, haven't you, Jane? Well, good lord, have I? I might have. <laughs> well, give us an idea. You, you appear to be the type of person who should have written about three books already. Oh, um, well, I I always feel that uh, I spark from other people's work, if you know yeah, what I mean. I, feel, cool. I do think yeah. curator is a really good description for what I, yeah. you know. I, that, that's nine-tenths of all books written, by the way. But is so, it? <laughs> yeah. Magpie might be another description. <laughs> you know, I like to just collect really interesting things. Um, and interestingly, do you know, studying now to be a business psychologist mm. is really interesting to get into the more, the sort of um, rigorous, side of research rather than just having an opinion or having read a few things and gone that makes me think this uh actually sort of getting underneath some of the more uh yeah academic rigor um which also makes me not want to be an academic interestingly yeah so is it that you that you really um my uh, daughter's um partner came around to help me uh, fix something the other day and he told me that he he basically if he doesn't know something then he'll it'll just, you know, find out because it, 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 it has that sense of curiosity about him. And, um, and I really admired him for that. And, and it's that kind, you know, nobody would have accused um, um, him of being, you know, you know, academic or anything like that. I mean, he's bright, very bright. But the point is it comes from that sort of thirst to be, to have a greater understanding um, and, and curiosity and I, I find that admirable in, in anybody, frankly, um, because, you know, you, you often, you know, that's how you find out. But with you, I think you can go really deep, can't you? That's why I think that, you you know, book writing should be something that you do. I, I shall take that career advice. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's free. <laughs> I was explaining. Graham, Graham's good at, good at advising people to write. He's lovely, yeah. I was saying yeah. to Kevin uh, at the beginning, we were talking about my website being down and I'm in the process of, of uh, launching a new one with the help of uh, where I live in Suffolk, there's a great initiative to we're trying to develop a really digital uh, community. I'm, I'm not doing them a service by describing them like that, but there's lots of very brilliant people doing some brilliant work. And, uh, and I've got some, some amazing help to, to kind of have. A, and, and the person who's helping me, Sam Parnell, she was talking about having a digital footprint and building a digital building for yourself as a representation and this was just like blowing my mind the realization that these things are you know this is the future going forward yes a digital building yeah so if you've got children or graduate anyone who's sort of computer age who's played things like uh fortnite no is it fortnite what's the one with the blocks mm, i'm gonna get in trouble with my nephew now there's a game where they build stuff anyway well that'd be lego cool. bricks but i mean uh, yeah, but that was that's too physical that's not digital is it yeah this is electronic so essentially the same idea that people organizations now are building digital buildings if you like and and occupying space in i'm really not i am not the person to be explaining oh, well, uh, well you know, kevin won't cut this out just because he's left my bit in earlier where i <laughs> i messed up so we're gonna leave this in yeah don't <laughs> it, what it'll what it'll what it'll for, for our listeners they'll they'll all know that we're we're authentic you know we we make mistakes <laughs> we can't remember I, stuff absolutely You've taken me down a route where I am now talking out of complete amateur kind of, I'm just curious, I'm on the edges of discovery. Well, you want a website? I mean, crikey, if you don't understand it. But no, seriously, you you obviously, I, 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 so the your website's coming back up and, and one of the, if you had to say on that website, the three things that you'd want to get across to people about you and your services, what would they be? Uh, very easy, leadership. Coaching and emotional intelligence. Um, those are the three core topics that whenever I try and move away from them, always bring me back. I think the leadership, I mean, there's a huge, I mean, you Google leadership, it put, it's, you put it in Amazon, you know, we've got 1800 titles, I know. But there's something around uh, the people that make good things happen in the world or not that I am constantly drawn to. And, 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 and they can be 
little people. I'm not talking about the, you know, the head of Unilever, uh, some of the most interesting and inspirational people. The coaching part for me is, is connecting with that humanity, is, is creating space for people to uh, recognise what's really going on for them and be slightly, you know, slightly better selves, if you like. Um, where do I want to go? What does that look like? What's stopping me? Mostly it's in my head. How do I move away from some of that stuff? And then emotional intelligence underpins all of that for me, um, th- that idea of just being good at being human. You know, oh, that's okay. essentially one of my main ambitions in life. Is you, to- you'll be able to model at least one of us um, for that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, answers on a postcard. Eh? <laughs> um, but I, I, if you had to say what em- emotional intelligence, what you've just said is it's being human. But we're all human, aren't we? Yeah. So the emotional intelligence part is for me is saying, um, I mean, and we'll, we'll, we'll refer to Daniel Goldman as the guru on the subject. Uh, and, and he suggests there's four key areas. There's self-awareness, uh, you know, who, why, what's going on for me at the moment? How am I? Am I aware of that? Then there's um, self-management. And, uh, you know, the, the line will always be, and now I know how I'm fit. I'm self-aware, but if I'm angry, I'm aware I'm angry. But if I punch you, I'm not actually in control of that anger. So there's this idea of self-regulation as well. So right. those two parts are the, the, the work that we do within ourselves. So how, how aware am I and how good am I at, interestingly, self-regulation covers things like discipline, procrastination, all of those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we have the kind of others two parts, and that's sort of external to us. And that's the little bit about uh, the extent to which um, I have the, the social skills, if you like, the, the ability to, to read others. So am I able to empathise? Can I imagine what it must feel like? Do I connect with other human beings? And then do I have the skills to manage those relationships? So um, how do I feel about being around conflict? How do I feel? How does it impact on me? How do I help others through it? Those are the kinds of threads that, that, for me, link so heavily to leadership. So when I've done my Google search, I'm the kind of person that looks like what when I found you? What, what, how do I rock up to you and your services? Oh, I see. So, well, interestingly, this is 2022 is my year of renewal and, uh, and re- hence the new website. Right. So uh, my... Uh, I I work predominantly as an associate to training companies, Um, but what I do work with is uh, usually senior leadership teams who are looking at the evolution of their work as as a team Mm -hmm. and also working with them alongside their development of strategic thinking. Uh, It it could usually it's about relationship building, emotional intelligence, coaching and strategy uh, and the links between them. So I don't do the work for them. I'm not I'm not a business consultant. Uh, my job is to sort of facilitate the work they need to do to get the job done. Got you. Mm. So I do a lot of work like that. But uh, my ambition this year is to create a, a working collective of occupational psychologists who can really get involved in some key projects for organisations to say, right, where do you want to get to? You know, well, what is it you really need to do and how can organisational psychology help that? Yeah, it sounds very much like a, a de- an away day that we had as a, as a board of trustees for a charity that I belong to um, um, at the beautiful Bolton Abbey, which if you ever get a chance to go, it's a lovely place. But um, and, and um, that was a coaching, a sort of a facilitation thing that went through a number of those things, you know, effectively how we should behave and all the rest mm-hmm. of that. Um, and um, the best bit of it, though, was that right at the beginning, um, it was a, virtually a hurricane the night before when we went. Um, and they said, right, well, we can go off for a walk. Well, I did. Thinking I needed, needed to do my 10,000 steps. So by, by the time I come back, she'd gone halfway right round. I was the last person to be introduced sort of thing. So they're fed up of waiting for me, but uh, such is life. But anyway, um, the idea of actually coaching people to be better humans, to have a greater awareness of their time, et cetera, that's your deliverable then. Well, I, it's probably my service. Is, it, is that a better way of describing it? Could be. Um, yeah. And, you know, I don't pretend to be hugely unique. There are a number of very well qualified people who are offering these services. Yeah. But I do think it's about fit. Um, you know, it's about finding the right. So there are certain organisations I've, I've refused to work with 
because when the way they've gone about what they want to do, you just go, we're not a good fit. I would have to um, negotiate my way of working to into a different shape to the one that I'm comfortable with. Uh, whereas then there are some organisations that I work with and just go, oh, yeah, this is this is good. It's challenging. It's stretching. It might be uncomfortable. But there's an aligned sense of, of purpose and um, we're in a similar ballpark, I suppose. What sort of organisation would that be? Tell us a little bit oh. about what, what that sort of organisation tends to look oh, like. So one, well, let me, how do I do? Yes, yeah, so there was an organisation, they were an Italian insurance company, there you go, based out in Trieste. Okay? And they, I'd, I'd done a piece of work with them and they wanted me to go back, but they wanted me to move into more of a traditional teaching training role rather than facilitation. And, and I thought, mm, it's good money, but I can't do it with all good conscience because it goes against what I believe about creation, not consumption, and that people should, uh, you should help people learn, not dictate to them and give them a checklist of this is how you do things. Creation, so, yeah. not consumption. Just explain that. Okay, yes, there's a principle from accelerated learning. Uh, I kind of, when I first got into training 12, 20 years ago, and it was this idea that it's like if you give a child a pen, uh, they don't just take the lid off and start writing. They kind of look at it and they explore it from all angles and they test it for different things that it might do. That curiosity, that testing, I think is what learning experiences should be like in the adult world. But the trouble is we get into school and then we're given a, a drive of, okay, um, this is what we know is the right answers. We're now going to tell you what the right answers are. And then we're going to test that you understand the right answers. And then we'll give you a badge to say, well done. You have achieved replication of knowledge. Whereas uh, I think as adults and in the work environment, creation is, is, is more powerful because it says, what do you think the answer is and why? And how do you test that? And what works best for your organisation, for your team, for you? And then off you go. I've got some stuff that you might find useful. Here's some academic research. Here's some models. But why don't you make your own? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an engaging with ideas and then saying, yeah, academics know some stuff, but maybe. Uh, I, I really get that. And I've got a, a young grandson, Louis, who's just coming up to two. And you know, he's into exploring everything at the moment. And I'm getting absolutely fascinated by just watching him and watching the way he finds out about things. And that nobody's told him anything yet. He's, he's picking it up for himself. He's learning it. He's exploring it. And he's, he's learning everything through play with no rules around it, which I just really wonder how you bring that back into the adult world. Because I, I think in most of our training and learning, we've lost something big. I totally agree. I, I, you need to come on one of my courses, Kim, and that's what you need to do. You see, <laughs> I think there's there's a danger. There is a danger that we assume that when we get promoted, we get cleverer. And I think we lose sight that the source of some of the best ideas will come from the most unusual places. Mm -hmm. But if in organisations we aren't creating space to hear those voices. So if your CEO isn't taking out your... Um, student placement guys for lunch after a couple of weeks and going what do you see what do you think's working what are you not if we aren't listening if the senior management aren't listening to that front line genuinely sincerely and respectfully then you're missing that that newness that you're explaining with your grandson that that kind of wonderment of why do they do it like that you know how why does that work what's what else would be different or better and i think creating that in, in the learning environment is is key to people owning the learning, which I think is the thing. It's not something that's done to them. And that's I, I, what I try to avoid. <laughs> it reminds me of that, that, that phrase when, when people were, were um, walking the floor so that you would actually, um, as a leader, you would actually go around and, and, and create time for exactly that, not to sort of lord it over people, but just simply just talk to people and listen to the things that are going right or wrong. And if you did it often enough, then people would share with you because they'd see you coming around every day and talking to people and and then doing something about what they'd heard. So it it's um it seems to me that there there's but that was probably learned about that in the well, I don't know, eighties. It's, it's great. New. We're right back to where this conversation started. That was called managing by walking about in circles that I was involved in. 
And what's the one thing that we're not doing anymore when we're all walking, working from home? That we you can't see, do that walking about. That, that's the, the huge bit that's missing. I told you he was brighter than me. He sees, he sees things that I don't, you see. Yeah, but um, th- what he didn't tell you about Louis, you know, his, his grandson, is he's, 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 there's a certain child abuse um, um, uh, uh, thing going on there because he's put a black and white shirt on him yeah, with Newcastle United. I, you know, I just think that's just... Graham, it gets even worse. His other granddad supports Millwall. <laughs> Oh, well, that really would be child abuse, <laughs> but um, God blimey! Um, but uh, but anyway, um, but uh, I, anyway, <laughs> better change the subject. Um, they'll have me in prison um, along with the rest of the Millwall fans. But um, no, no, seriously, um, Jane, you've been a, a brilliantly. I don't think we could if we had if we didn't have a stop to this podcast, we'd we'd sail right by it. Because you're just a mine of information, a mine of of very useful um, uh, ways of thinking about things, and I I want to wish you all the best with with you know your your burgeoning career and and the new website which we'll have a look at and we'll refer to and we'll link from our website. Um, and Jane, um, thank you so much for joining us today on the next 100 Days podcast. Graham, are you going to throw your leather-bound time manager in the bin? <laughs> um, probably. Um, I actually, it probably has gone in the bin thinking about it because I don't think I've, I've still got it. But I do have um, the Time Manager International booklet that came along with it. Um, and um, it, it had some pretty good stuff in it, in fairness. Um, and I think, like you, some of the things that I learned from that, I, in fact, I still use an annual overview um on on my little dartboard here where i can actually just um you know see things at a glance um I still break things down to my nine key areas <laughs> right that's impressive but they, but i think the thing about jane is that she kind of dug it's almost like she dug a tunnel or two way below that into the sort of the reasons why we get into these fugs when it comes to uh, time and and the management of time and the management of yourself, I guess, and and I like the idea that she's got this free engagement course through the Nine Dots um, organization, and basically you can actually, if you if you like Jane, and I think you should like Jane, then you know tune into that. There'll be a link in the show notes. Click that and make make yourself because um, if if you pro- procrastinate, then do something about it. Mm. Absolutely. But I, I think just exploring that whole question of what is work in our new way of doing things mm. is, is quite fascinating because we, we definitely had a previous view that you know, we commuted into an office, we commuted home from an office, and work was the stuff that happened in between those two events. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And now, ho- like hopefully, um, the announcement uh, recently made by the government to, to um, free us all up again uh, and say back to normal lads um then basically that will hopefully bring back the best of that um and and i actually genuinely want people to go back to their offices i think it's good for people and i, I genuinely think that a lot of you know we you and i have made it work working from home and for many people they'll be able to do that as well but i think for the majority get them back to work well, get them back yeah, to their offices it's it works when you're working by yourself and your mm. agenda is pretty much self-centered, Graham. But you know, we mentioned during the, the conversation with Graham that fundamental thing about managing by walking about. Yeah. Do that on a Zoom call. No. <laughs> yeah, no. the number of con I've speaking to people in, in Grow CFO, potential people we're talking to about doing uh, finance team training. Now, we're finding that that's still something they're grappling with is uh, it's fine having these conversations over zoom, but all you ever do is stick to the agenda. What happened to all those conversations used to happen at the coffee machine. Yeah, if you've got, if you want to impair it by somebody's desk and they have some balloons up, then nine, nine tenths chance that you wouldn't have known that it was Sally's birthday, but the balloons give it away a bit. Yeah. Or that there's a picture of a grandchild or there's a picture of, you know, whatever the uh, whatever it is, but you can you can feed off that 
and and actually make for a much better working environment where you know you're together there's that togetherness and i think that's kindness for me the kind of unkind thing is for a client to ring into their organization and the first thing you hear on the phone uh, things are going to get a bit delayed because of covid and you think really why is that then oh well everybody's at home answering the phone right okay so why aren't you a bit quicker to answer the phone rather than waiting 20 minutes before you do it's there's um i think what's happened is that it uh, that covid has actually built some excuses into the way in which we deal with customers and the quicker we can get back to the way in which organizations did deal and will deal in the future with customers the better mm, i totally agree graham and on that bombshell and on that bombshell today i've been graham arrowsmith i've been kevin appleby goodbye goodbye